The NFL is a copycat league. Usually when one team has success with a new wrinkle in a scheme or maybe a certain body type at a key position or even inventing a new position entirely, every other team is soon to follow in their footsteps. When it comes to the Eagles, however, their blueprint for a Super Bowl victory is much more difficult to reproduce. They aren't the only coaching staff that uses run-pass option plays, they aren't the only roster with a big body wide receiver and a mismatch weapon at tight end, and they aren't the only team to get creative with how they use their defensive line. What they are, however, is the only organization in the NFL that has built their roster with a very specific, very nuanced, and very hard to copy formula. The Howie Roseman formula, as I call it. After studying several years of Eagles draft trends, free agency priorities, and salary cap management, taking out of course the bonkers decisions made by Chip Kelly when he was head coach, I've come to a broader understanding of this new team building philosophy. Whether or not the rest of the league will be able to replicate it is anyone's guess, but they are definitely going to try. History has assured us of that. So, if the other 31 general managers want to build a team that can mirror the Eagles, they first have to recognize and follow the same rules as the Eagles. Some are pretty conventional, some are not, but the first and most important rule is that quarterbacks are everything. And I mean everything. Howie Roseman has poured as many resources as humanly possible into the quarterback position, and not just to acquire starting quarterbacks like Sam Bradford and Carson Wentz, but to get backup quarterbacks too, like when he paid $7 million annually to Chase Daniel, which was a big contract at the time for a second stringer. After all, you're only as good as your backup quarterback, which was a lesson that Roseman taught the rest of the league once again last season. I suppose it's ironic that the two teams in the NFC with the most commitment to Plan B were also the two teams to make the conference championship game. Howie's fascination with quarterbacks goes even beyond starters and starter quality backups though because he's one of the few general managers that understands how to use QBs as currency to either replenish assets or generate new assets. In 2015, the Eagles traded Nick Foles and two other picks to the Rams for Sam Bradford, again trying to use whatever resources they could to upgrade their starting quarterback. One year later, after spending even more resources to upgrade yet again and get Carson Wentz, Roseman traded Bradford to Minnesota to get back some of those resources he lost when he traded up for Wentz. And then, the year after that, he re-signed Foles as a free agent to be Wentz's backup. Wentz got hurt, Foles played well and won the Super Bowl, and now Roseman is just biding his time until he can trade Foles again to get even more picks back. As Chris Mortensen reported, he very well could get yet another first round pick out of that deal if another team is desperate enough and loses a quarterback to injury. The Eagles are so next level with how they've handled their quarterback situation that I legitimately don't know if any other team could mimic them even if they tried. They've not only found their stud franchise quarterback of the future by maneuvering in the draft, but they've found bridge quarterbacks and quality backups in free agency that have been used to make the acquisition of that franchise quarterback basically free of charge. And you know what, if Foles does get traded to a desperate bidder, then the Eagles will have actually gained draft capital throughout this whole quarterback saga and still got Carson Wentz out of the deal. Handling the quarterback position is rule number one for every team in the league, but sometimes I think the Eagles are the only front office that really understands everything that goes into that beyond just quote, finding the guy. They have truly turned this into an art form. Now, rule number two of the Howie Roseman formula, build the trenches. And even when you think you're done building them, build some more. Offensive line, defensive line, it doesn't matter which one you take in the first round, as long as you take one of them. Since 2010, when Howie took over as the GM, excluding those Chip Kelly years, of course, the Eagles have taken just one player in the first round that was not a pass rusher or a pass protector, and that's Carson Wentz. Every other first rounder, Brandon Graham, Danny Watkins, Fletcher Cox, Lane Johnson, Marcus Smith, and Derek Barnett all played on either the offensive or defensive lines. Three of them became all pros too, which is a very high hit rate for all pro picks in the first round. Roseman understands that his team cannot function if the offensive line can't protect anybody or run block for anybody, and if the defensive line can't sack anybody or stop the run. So beyond just first round picks, he throws loads of cap space at the lines as well. 
When Jason Kelsey, a sixth round pick, emerged as one of the best centers in the league and a key piece for their zone heavy run game, Roseman wasted no time in locking him up to a six year $40 million extension, which by today's standards is actually extremely cheap for the kind of value he generates. Roseman has also extended Jason Peters multiple times to make sure his left tackle spot is secure, he spent big money on Brandon Brooks a couple years ago to solidify right guard, and two off seasons ago he gave a massive six year extension to Lane Johnson as well. The Eagles do not screw around when it comes to spending resources on the offensive line, but even their commitment to that unit is dwarfed by their commitment to the defensive line. Brandon Graham got a four-year extension as a former first-round pick and then outperformed his salary and became a stud playing on a discount. Fletcher Cox has always been a first-round stud and is being paid like it. They also drafted Vinnie Curry and gave him a nice extension and then cut him loose once they brought in Michael Bennett, who they also traded for. Oh, and last year they also spent yet another first-rounder on the defensive line with Derek Barnett, and I haven't even mentioned the free agent signings like Chris Long and Helody Nada and their super high upside draft pick from this year in Josh Sweat. I mean, my God, between all the draft, trade, and financial capital they've spent on this defensive line, it's no wonder why they're basically three deep at every position. You want to know why it always looks like the Eagles defense is playing fast and aggressive well into the fourth quarter? It's because they are, because they never get tired. They never have to play an entire game's worth of snaps. This whole trend of teams trying to build their defensive lines to constantly rotate and come at you in waves is because of the Eagles because that's what Howie Roseman built this line to do, and it worked. The Eagles committed to protecting their quarterback and murdering the other quarterback at any cost, and now the rest of the NFL is scrambling to get as many defensive linemen as possible to replicate that. If they want to make it work like Philly did, however, they have to be disciplined like the Eagles and strictly adhere to the next rule on this list, or it just won't be possible. Rule number three, safeties are more important than corners when it comes to amount of money spent compared to amount of value generated. Two of the top 13 highest paid safeties in the league are in Philadelphia, Malcolm Jenkins and Rodney McLeod, and yet they still make way, way less than the top cornerbacks. In fact, there are only five safeties in the whole NFL that make more than $10 million a year on average, and for corner, that number is almost tripled at 14. To Howie Roseman, it's a hell of a lot cheaper to pay a do-it-all Pro Bowl caliber safety than a do-it-all Pro Bowl caliber corner. And truth be told, in my opinion, it's harder to find good safeties that fit the Eagles scheme compared to good corners that fit their scheme. Modern safeties, at least in the Eagles system, need to be extraordinarily flexible. They have to be physical in the box as that eighth man against the run, especially if they're the force player on the edge. They need to have the range to play in center field and protect the seams. They need to be able to bump down in the slot and man coverage if necessary. They have to be able to do everything that a corner does in both man or zone, and then some, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that have to match up with the matchup problems on offense. All of these receiving tight ends that are basically just big wide receivers, the scat backs, the little slot receivers, a lot of the time those guys are getting covered by safeties. So if you've got really bad safeties, guess what? It doesn't matter how good or highly paid your corners are. It really doesn't. You're going to get torn up anyway. And on top of that, in my opinion, corners are basically just the running back of defense and how he understands that. You can find great corners at a value just like you can find great running backs at a value. There are of course always the exceptions like Jalen Ramsey, Patrick Peterson, Aqib Tlaib, or Marshawn Lattimore that you just know they're going to be slam dunks and they're going to be good no matter what as first round picks. But there's a lot of slam dunks at running back too. Todd Gurley, Zeke Elliott, Leonard Fournette, Saquon Barkley. People always say why draft Leonard Fournette at fourth overall when you could have gotten Alvin Kamara on day two. Well, by the same logic, why draft Patrick Peterson at 5th overall when you can get Casey Hayward, Darius Slayer, Janoris Jenkins on day 2, or Richard Sherman and Josh Norman on day 3, or Chris Harris, Brent Grimes, Sam Shield, Malcolm Butler, and AJ Boye as undrafted free agents? There is as much or more value at cornerback than every other position in the game, and just like running back, finding a good corner is less about finding some super freak talent that can do everything, and more about finding someone who can just play a role and fit a scheme. It's really not a hard position to get if you know what to look for, and the Eagles certainly know how to find value at that spot. You just take a look at how they've handled that position the last couple years. Sidney Jones fell to the second round because of an Achilles injury, so they scooped him up at a value. Ronald Darby was on the market in Buffalo, so Roseman packaged a third round pick with Jordan Matthews to go get him. Again, that's a starting corner that plays like a first rounder that was acquired for less than first round resources. They signed Patrick Robinson off the street for less than a million dollars to be their role player at nickel. 
he played well, and then the Eagles let him go to New Orleans for a $20 million contract because they knew that despite his good play last year, they can replace him for way cheaper. And they did just that by drafting Avante Maddox in the fourth round, by the way. This is all part of the same formula. Pay less at corner and trust your scouts to find value so that you can pay more at safety and defensive line, and pay less at running back with J.H.I. Jay still on a rookie contract so that you can pay more at tight end and offensive line. If you want to know why Howie Roseman is seen as a cap god that always manages to find more money in the piggy bank, it's because he knows exactly where to spend that money to preserve value. He doesn't throw out huge contracts to every position because, quite frankly, not every position is important in this formula. It's all a very simple equation that more teams could benefit from if they would be disciplined enough to follow it, but that's obviously easier said than done. However, there is one trend that Howie Roseman is setting that I think more teams are capable of following immediately, and it doesn't really have anything to do with cap management or generating value with sneaky trades, but rather how the modern NFL offense adapts to the modern NFL defense. For decades, defenses put their best pass rushers on the blind side of the quarterback, which was almost always against the left tackle. The idea was that if the quarterback could not see your best pass rusher coming, then it was less likely for him to step up away from the pressure, and if you're lucky, you might get a free shot at forcing a fumble. With the best pass rushers lining up over the left tackle, offenses began prioritizing finding good left tackles over good right tackles. And after enough years of that cycle, most of the NFL somehow fell into this mentality of having a good pass protector on the left side while basically completely ignoring the right side. If you had bad feet and bad technique and pass protection, but you could run block, you were given this mystical label of road grader, and all the sacks you gave up were just hand waved away because, well, screw it, you're a right tackle. You're supposed to be bad in pass protection. That's just kind of how it is. If you were good in pass protection, you'd be playing on the left side anyway, so it only makes sense to have you sucking on the right side. This flawed way of thinking continued on for about 25 years until the 2000s, where the pass game exploded to heights that we had never even dreamed of before. Tom Brady was breaking records, which were then broken again by Peyton Manning. Kurt Warner threw the ball all over the yard with his old man strength. Drew Brees basically became king of New Orleans. Phillip Rivers and Ben Roethlisberger channeled every ounce of their energy into Eli Manning to repeatedly f*** the Patriots. Matt Stafford was throwing a billion passes a game, and Aaron Rodgers not only replaced Brett Favre, but arguably surpassed him as the best quarterback in Packers history. I mean, damn, Matt Schaub once threw for 527 yards and five touchdowns in a single game. Matt Schaub. Things were clearly getting out of hand, and it took a long time for defensive coordinators to finally mercifully catch up to it. As more and more passes were being thrown in this new era of football, those same defensive coordinators eventually noticed a trend. Right tackles still, for the most part, really sucked in pass protection. So if all these quarterbacks wanted to throw so much, defenses were going to punish them where they were weakest, the right tackle. All of a sudden, premier pass rushers abandoned their matchups with Joe Thomas, Dwayne Brown, and Trent Williams in favor of easier matchups against whatever traffic cone was lined up on the other side, and as a result, all of their numbers predictably skyrocketed. J.J. Watt, Von Miller, Justin Houston, Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, Ryan Kerrigan, Cameron Jordan, Demarcus Lawrence, Cameron Wake, Brandon Graham, Michael Bennett, and Jason Pierre-Paul all of them make up a big chunk of the list of the top pass rushers in any particular order, and all of them predominantly line up against right tackles. The age of attack in the blind side is over, and it has been for quite some time, which is why I respect Howie Roseman for recognizing that trend and countering it by treating the right tackle position as the premium position on the offensive line. Lane Johnson, at least physically, is built to play left tackle in the NFL. He's six foot six, incredibly athletic with an explosive first step that you rarely ever see, and an absolutely insane 35 and a quarter inch arm length, which is even more rare to see. He is without a doubt one of the freakiest offensive line prospects to enter the league ever. Not just in the last 10 years, I'm talking ever. And what did the Eagles do with that kind of prospect? They put him at right tackle and kept him there, even when Jason Peters was lost for the year halfway through the 2017 season. They left him at that right tackle position because they knew that in today's NFL, having an elite right tackle is actually more important than having an elite left tackle. Throughout the 2017 regular season, Johnson lined up against Kerrigan, Houston, Pierre Paul, Bosa, Miller, Lawrence, Bennett, and Mack. Altogether, that group totaled 87 sacks on the year, almost 11 sacks per player on average. After facing all of those Pro Bowl and All-Pro pass rushers, do you know how many of those 87 sacks that Lane Johnson allowed? 
zero. He shut every single one of them down. Snap after snap, game after game, the best edge rushers the NFL has to offer all challenge Lane Johnson one-on-one, -on -one, and they all lost. With how close games are in this league, where one strip sack can decide the winner, or even just one pressure coming at the worst possible time to ruin a sure touchdown pass, having a right tackle that can prevent those strip sacks or prevent those pressures is the difference between winning and losing. Howie Roseman understands that. So to me, when I look at the Roseman formula and how he builds a team, I think what the rest of the league can take away from it is not just that you should throw big chunks of your cap into the defensive line, or that corners are expendable, or that right tackles are more important than left tackles. All of those things are absolutely true, and I guarantee you that all 31 other teams will mimic them in one form or another. But the true key to Howie's philosophy, the one thing that makes it all work, is knowing how to adapt. He adapted to changes in modern pass rushers, which were just a further adaptation to modern offensive lines. He adapted to shifting quarterback situations around the league and knew how to exploit them for his own benefit. He understands not just how the NFL works today, but he can see and predict how it's going to work three, four, and five years from now, and he's already getting a plan in place to adapt to that too. The Howie Roseman formula is so good because Roseman himself is never afraid to change it. Quite frankly, he's a genius, a flat out brilliant tactical mind. I know the NFC is a total slaughterhouse right now, and it's unlikely that the Eagles are going to win back-to-back -back rings because of that. But when I look at this team, this roster that Roseman built in his image, with his philosophy, it's hard for me to not believe on some level that they could do it. I think Philly winning the Super Bowl is going to send more ripples through the NFL than we realize, and even though I'm just breaking down this Eagles roster now, I guarantee you the rest of the league has already gone through this exact same exercise. They know what Howie did, they know how he did it, and they know what they need to do to copy him. The only thing they probably don't know is this. When the f*** is Chip Kelly going to drop that other shoe? I mean seriously, it's been three goddamn years. Hurry the f*** up. This is how we do it. Howie Roseman, a few years ago, was relinquished of all control pretty much in this organization. He was put in the side, hey, hey! He was put in the side of the building where I didn't see him for over a year. Two years ago, when they made a decision, he came out of there a different man. He came out of there with a purpose and a drive to make this possible. And I saw a different Howie Roseman, an underdog. Thank you so very much for watching this week's episode. Uh, I know it was way longer and also way different than most of the stuff I put on this channel, but man, I had a lot of fun making it. I hope you guys had a lot of fun watching it. And if you are watching this today on release day, then I'm probably on my way to Europe right now for my honeymoon. My, my long belated honeymoon, or I'm probably just sitting in LAX answering comments. But anyway, I've got a few really cool episodes planned for when I get back from that, which is gonna be around the first week of June. And uh, before you know it, a couple months in, it's gonna be late July and training camp starting up and preseason, and then we're back to the regular season grind. So I've, I've got some cool stuff to get us through summer and then we're right back into this thing. And I'm, I'm super stoked about that. Uh, but anyway, thank you again for supporting me on Patreon and keeping this channel going. You guys are the lifeblood of this whole operation. I, I do not exaggerate at all. I, I could not do this without you. And I also appreciate all of the honeymoon well wishes you guys gave us too. My wife really appreciated that, especially because uh, <laughs> I, we had to you know, postpone the honeymoon for seven months, so it's, it wasn't an easy thing to do. Uh, if you happen to live in Paris or Switzerland, by the way, and you have any restaurant or hiking recommendations, feel free to post those in the comments. I'm always looking for good food when I'm traveling. So, you know, the more local recommendations we get, the better, because we always trust, you know, the, the people that live there. But uh, anyway, with that, thank you all again for your support. I'll be back in a couple weeks. And until then, later. Later.